Welcome everyone. I want to ask you a question. Here's my question. Where would it be more effective to put the handle of a door? If you want the ability to rotate a door, like a bathroom door, we typically put those handles towards the outside of the door, farther away from the axis of rotation right here of the door. Would it be easier if we put the door handle right here in the middle, or if we put it right over here, right next to the hinge? Would it be easier to do that? And the answer is no. You already know this in your everyday life. You already know that it makes sense if we want the ability to rotate an object, it matters where we apply that force. And the greater the distance from the axis of rotation, from this axis right here, the greater the ability we have to rotate an object. At this point, what we are talking about is an introduction to a concept called torque. Torque is very foundational to ideas of rotation. This is appropriate for a physics class or an AP physics class. And so let's go ahead and talk about what torque is. Torque, we're going to say, is a force that is applied at a distance to an axis of rotation, which can cause rotation of the object. One component is going to be force, and that we've already talked about. A second component is going to be where that force is applied. If we take a look at option A, B, or C, it turns out, of course, that option C is going to have the greatest turning power or the greatest torque. The greatest ability to rotate this object will be as if the force is applied at option C. We can also talk about an angle involved, too. So even if the force is kept the same throughout all three of our options, if the angle is different, there will be different amounts of torque. So if you take a look at this, my question is, which of these three options is going to have the greatest torque on this door? I want you to think about it and mentally answer that. Secondly, my other question is, is there going to be any torque at all for option A? To answer my first question, option C is going to have the greatest torque value, and option A is going to have the least. In fact, option A is going to have no torque value whatsoever. This force has no ability to rotate the door. And so there are three components then, therefore, that you already know about that we need to take into account when we talk about our torque equation. The first is the force. The force is going to be proportional to the torque. The greater the force, all things being equal, the greater the torque. Second, we have to deal with the angle involved at which that force is applied. If the angle is off at a, at a more shallow angle, it's going to have less torque. Third, we have to deal with the distance between the axis of rotation, which is here for this diagram, to where the force is applied. So the greater that distance or that radius is, the greater the ability to rotate the object is, so the greater the torque is going to be. Okay, and so one thing that we have started to talk about is the idea that torque is going to be dependent on the perpendicular component of this force. So we're not worried about the component of the force that's in this plane right here. We're worried about the component of the force that's in this plane right here. So you could say that is the force that is perpendicular between the axis of rotation and where the force is applied. So let me go ahead and talk to you about that. This is usually written as R in an AP physics classroom. In a standard physics classroom, this is going to be written as a D most likely. But it's just the distance between the axis of rotation and where the force is applied. There are different ways to teach this, different ways to think about this with a concept called a lever arm. I think this actually makes a lot more sense. If we take a look at the force perpendicular here, you're going to be looking at an angle. Now it depends on the angle that you're given. You're either given this angle here or you're given the complement of that angle. But we could say that in the end we are just focused on the force or a component of the force that is perpendicular to this distance right here, this radius right here. All right, so if you're in an AP class, this is going to be your equation towards the top. And if you're in a regular physics classroom, this is going to be your equation most likely. Something along those lines. I think you can understand it better if you think to yourself, all right, what does this mean? Notice the positions are changed, but here we've got this D value is the same as this R value down here. Fair enough. We can also say that this signifies in our AP physics equations that this is a cross product. And one way I want you to think about that is to think about, yeah, we're interested in the force that is crossing with this vector right here. And in fact, this is a vector, this is a vector, 
and our torque is also going to have a vector, and so that's why I have three of these vector symbol notations at the top of this equation here, and that's what you're given on the AP equation sheet, is this equation right here. Okay, and so I've given you three example problems. I've made them as simple as possible to be able to get the idea and think through these ideas. So let's take a look at our first example. So if we have a force applied at 10 newtons, so I've made the same force for all three examples, 10 newtons here and here and here, then let's say the angle at which that force is applied is 90 degrees. The R value, which is down here, is going to be 3 meters. The question is how much torque is produced. And similarly, for the second scenario, we've got this scenario right here. This is going to be our R value. I forgot to connect this little line right here, but you get the idea. The same force value, but it is applied at an angle. If you look over here at example three, you've got the same angle, but it is a different reference line. So this reference line is now vertical. So the calculation you do is actually going to be different. Let's take a moment. So please pause the video, take a moment, and work these problems out using this equation up here and thinking through what does it mean we really only want the component of this force that is perpendicular to the r vector. So work out those example problems right now, please. Okay, and hopefully you work those out. So for the first example problem, all we're going to do is multiply that force times that distance. The sine, you could, you could argue it's like multiplying also by the sine of 90 degrees, which is 1, and so you end up with 30 newton meters. This has the same value as a joule, but we don't call these joules. This second example right here, you're going to use the sine function because you're looking for the opposite leg of this right triangle right over here from this angle's perspective. And so you're going to have a sine of 30 component thrown in there. And for the third problem, we are going to say essentially that you're going to use the cosine here. Why cosine in one example and sine in another example? That's because you're still looking for the component leg that is perpendicular to the R value, to the R vector. In other words, you could say the reference line we have for the second example is the horizontal, and the reference line we have for the first example for that angle is the vertical, and that's why you end up with two different trig functions in our answer, and why you end up with two different answers. One thing that you will need to know as we start to talk about torque and as we build on these ideas is that you can consider torque and rotation to be positive if you measure starting from the positive x-axis and you measure going counterclockwise. And you can say that if you're going to measure from below the positive x-axis, then you can call that a negative angle or a negative torque would cause a negative rotation effectively would be caused by a negative torque, you could say. So next what I want you to think about is a slap. There's a reason for this. I want you to think about what direction the force would be coming from if someone was giving someone else a slap. And so for the person who is being slapped, they would experience a force coming from the palm of that person. This is how I want you to remember this because there is a related physics idea. This related physics idea is called the right-hand rule. This is useful in multiple concepts in physics, so one concept that we use this is in torque. Torque is a cross product, and so one of the things that we mean by that is that you can set up a right-hand rule like we have over here and think through what that would mean. If you imagine that the force is coming out of the palm of the hands, then the direction of the fingers would show the direction of the other vector, in this case the R value, your torque vector would be in the same direction as the right thumb. Another way of doing this is using the right hand rule with two curled fingers at the bottom. In this case you still need to remember like the force is coming out of the palm of the hand, kind of like a slap. In this way this could be written as an R, but this is a very generalized right hand rule that will apply to multiple situations in physics. So in this case, this is going to be our F value, this is going to be our R value, and the cross between R and F would be our torque value, and that would be what you would get out here in the direction of the thumb. And the reason why that's important is because we are dealing with vectors in three dimensions, so you have to have a system to be able to think through this, and this is a very handy way to be able to do that. And that concludes our initial talk about torque. That's the basis of torque. So we are going to continue with other ideas. I will do more screencasts that will relate to this and build on these ideas. Thank you for listening. Please continue to listen.